1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Monday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Father John Trujillo is in the house. If you've got a question for Father John, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line if you are outside of North America at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. I'm Jack Williams. Michael McCall produces the program. Your call screener is Matt Kubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat room, chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host, as he is every Monday, Father John Tregilio, how are you? Doing well, thank you. You're you're vagabonding a little bit. Where are you at today? I'm where I've been for a little while here in New Jersey. Oh, you're just a little little bit different immediate surroundings. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm helping Father Briganti pack up because he's being transferred to Ohio as the vice rector of the Josephinum Seminary. Yes, we had heard that. So congratulations to him and uh, hooray for the seminarians at the Josephinum. Um, Father, we had a, a caller who called uh, called to communion during the last hour here uh, at EWTN, and uh, we ran out of time and were not able to get to them, but they had a mm. question that I thought was interesting. Okay. And they wanted to know why the guardian angels of shooting victims didn't seem to do anything. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, that's a, it's a good question. Um, the guardian angel's job is not for primarily to save us from injury or even death. Their primary uh, duty is to protect us, help us in the spiritual battle. Now, that doesn't mean that they, they cannot, and I've heard many stories, and I myself can attest to the fact there were moments where uh, I was in a horrible accident, and I, I really should not have survived, and I believe my guardian angel intervene, but that was part of God's uh, divine plan. Um, but more importantly, when you were being tempted for a mortal sin, the guardian angel is there to help encourage us to avoid it. Angels, as well as demons, cannot uh, affect our free will. So an angel can't force you to do good, and a demon can't force you to do bad. But uh, I know people ask the question, like when there's a plane crash, or all these horrible uh, shootings we've been seeing, or bombings and other acts of terrorism or um, murder and whatnot, people ask, well, where was their guardian angel? They, they were not negligent. Um, their job is not to prevent the sequence of events that happen, whether it's a natural uh, calamity or evil or it's of human evil. And certainly even with an innocent person, you think of all the, the holy saints who died uh, during the time of Jesus' birth with King Herod or the, the children that were slain by Pharaoh or all the people who died uh, during the, the the Holocaust or during the wars and and whatnot or 9/11, so yeah, it's a, it's it's hard to grapple with. It's the mystery of of, of suffering and evil, but a guardian angel I- again, their my their main assignment is not to prevent all harm coming to us, but their main goal is to help us in the battle uh, against evil and to choose good. Do the abilities of guardian angels or angels in general? Uh, have any reliance on God's perfect will versus God's permissive will? Well, certainly uh, they have to obey the will of God. That's their 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 function, and uh, certainly ours as well. So it, it's part of God's permissive will that things happen because they act according to their nature. So if I get up on the top of the roof and I'm not properly um, secure— I shouldn't be up on the roof anyway <laughs> in my, in my <laughs> aging condition. If I fall off, I can't blame my guardian angel. The laws of gravity, the laws of physics, the laws of uh, you know mental and physical health are such that my guardian angel can't uh, intervene in that way. Um, but I again, like I said, I was in a couple of uh, accidents where the state policeman said, 
He says, Father, you, you shouldn't be here. Your guardian angel must have helped you. So I know sometimes people say, well, then why does that always happen? And as you just mentioned, there's part of God's uh, permissive will. And many times a greater good comes from uh, e e even a tragedy. So it's something we, we grapple with. And I would recommend reading Salvifici Dolores on so, um, Salvific Suffering by Pope John Paul the Great. You know, and I, I always liked it in the Gospels when they're talking about the the sort of the little prophecy that involved Peter, where it said that one day he would be led, uh, you know, somewhere where, that he didn't want to go. And it says that this foretold the death by which he would glorify God. And sometimes, you know, that's maybe why death occurs in situations when we, when our, you know, intellect doesn't want to understand why. Exactly, and it's 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 above our pay grade if you want to put it in a more colloquial uh, context. Got an uh, got an email here from Gus. It says, "Dear Father Trujillo, thank you for the excellent shows, and thank you to the staff at Open Line." Question: How is penance beneficial to our spiritual life? Well, uh, penance uh, is is beneficial because its primary purpose is to engender in us remorse for past sins and evils uh, that we've done. Um, mortification is uh, self-denial that we do not as a penance, but as a preparation, a spiritual exercise. So when we do acts of penance, and again, always, always, always under the direction and guidance of your spiritual director or your confessor, because some people can go a little too far and they, they might do uh, um, unnecessary penance or more severe penance, or no, they may do it for too long. You need guidance. You should not do this by yourself, just like you should not perform surgery on yourself. <laughs> A doctor would recommend that you not do that. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-398. Ben says, when Jesus died in the scripture, say, say that people were raised from the dead and the veil was torn. What actually happened? Well, the veil that was torn, uh, there, there's the symbolic veil, the veil of death. And then there's the physical literal veil, uh, which is um, in the um, temple in Jerusalem, in the Holy of Holies, uh, where the uh, Ark of the Covenant uh, resided. There was a curtain, literally, that... Uh, protected it and it, 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 you no one was allowed to cross it not even the the high priest so when jesus died the veil was torn refers to both those uh, things one that the literal veil was torn to show that the old uh, covenant had been fulfilled and secondly that death no longer uh, was a veil that per, that prevented us from getting to see god so uh it was a metaphysical and uh, analogous as well as uh, literal Emily wants to know, why are permanent deacons only dudes? <laughs> because uh, as Pope John Paul the Great um, issued that wonderful statement that at, then Cardinal Ratzinger said was infallible teaching in Ordinatio Sartre de Tallis, uh, only baptized males can be ordained, whether it's to the diaconate, the priesthood, or to the episcopacy. And again, that's because uh, in holy orders, one is configured to Christ and acts in the person of Christ, and therefore uh, reflects Jesus, who was a man. Even though he, in his divinity, there is no gender, uh, in his um, humanity, he was definitely a male. And uh, It's not a slight to females. Uh, women like the Blessed Mother, uh, Mary, got the, 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 Mary got more grace than any human being could possibly get, and yet she was not called uh, to holy orders by her son. And uh, that's why, because uh, the, the three levels of holy orders, deacon, priest, and and, and bishop, um, that's absolute dogma that, that cannot be changed. And the constitutive element, uh, that what is necessary to be ordained, uh, a baptized male is required. We're just getting started on a Monday edition of EWTN's Open Line. Our Monday host, Father John Trujillo, is in the house. If you uh, would like to speak with Father Trujillo, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 
288-3986. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Bill in Colorado, Camilla in San Antonio, Texas, Joseph in the great state of Maryland, and we hope to talk to you as well. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we still want to hear from you. That number is one 205 271-2985. It's EWTN's Open Line Monday. The number to be on the program, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's EWTN's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. It's the 2022 World Meeting of Families. EWTN takes you to Rome as church leaders, families, and delegates from around the world celebrate family love as a vocation and path to holiness. From the Festival of Families with Pope Francis to Masses and more, EWTN will bring you complete coverage. It all begins with the World Meeting of Families preview show, Tuesday, June 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern on EWTN-TV. Hi, I'm Greg Willits from RosaryArmy.com. And I'm Jennifer Willits, his wife. Sadly, many people think the rosary is just something that diehard Catholics pray. But anyone who loves the Bible should love the rosary. The rosary has the scriptures as its foundation, going back more than 1,200 years when it was developed as a way for people to pray along with monasteries as they prayed through the Psalms, eventually becoming a daily meditation on the Gospels themselves. Praying the rosary with a Bible open next to you makes the prayer even more more dynamic. When you pray the sorrowful mysteries, read John 19 verses 12 through 17 and truly place yourself on the side of the road during Christ's passion. When we pray the rosary, we place ourselves directly into the events of Christ's life, giving the prayer even more richness and meaning. Find out more about the rosary at rosaryarmy.com. And you can listen to our shows, Adventures in Imperfect Living, Catechism Class, and more wherever you find your favorite podcasts. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. One line open for you at 833-288-3986. First up today is Camilla in San Antonio, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Camilla, you're on with Father John Tregilio. Hello, Father. Thank you guys for taking my call. Um, My question, I am in a relationship with a non-Catholic, a Protestant. I'm Catholic. And um, whenever I'm talking to, like, friends or family, whatever, um, and this person happens to be a Protestant as well, um, whenever I tell them, hey, you know, this point in our relationship, we are still discerning marriage because, you know, different religions. And so my question is, how do I respond to them, if, if at all, um, when they say, well, you know, it's the same God, it doesn't matter? Yeah, uh, and, and I know that's very common and... and uh... You know, very typical. Um, it's true; it's the same God, uh, but the the idea is that as Catholic Christians, uh, we're not we don't see ourselves that we're right and everyone else is wrong, or that we're better than everyone else. But we have the fullness of truth because we have divine revelation through both sacred scripture and sacred tradition, and we have the fullness of grace because we have all seven sacraments. So, in the Catholic Church, we have the fullness of what God provides. Uh, to uh, the Christian people, and therefore uh, there's more opportunities, there's there's more blessings. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's nothing available in our separated brethren uh, in, in their faith traditions, obviously, but we want them to realize that this is the fullness. So uh, for someone to make, and, and I know this happens a lot, especially from non-Catholics, they say, well, it's like the difference between living in New Jersey or Alabama or Pennsylvania. Uh, we're, we're all Americans, so it doesn't matter what state you live in. 
But I say it's more like the difference between if you live in Canada or you live in the United States, very similar cultures, but there's more than just an identity. Uh, there's a culture, there's uh, a patrimony, uh, there's a, a defining uh, ethos uh, to it. And so uh, when someone asks us about you know, our Catholicity, we, we, we should not be afraid to say, you know what, I'm so happy of what, uh, what we have as Catholic Christians that I, I want to share it. Now, if your um, husband-to-be do doesn't choose to accept that, uh, that's fine. You can still uh, get married in, in the Catholic Church, um, but you'd be surprised how many um, people who are married to Catholics uh, very soon realize and see the uh, the effect it has on their on their spouse, and then they decide uh, to come into the church. Um, now these other people, you know, they're not necessarily open to having a full discussion. They're just you know, voicing their opinion, uh, I would just take it with a grain of salt and, and not be uh, in, insulted by it. But the same token, you know, uh, be, be firm in your faith without, you know, it being uh, intimidating. Thanks so much, Camilla. We'll keep you in our prayers. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next stop is the great state of Maryland. Joseph is in Maryland listening on Guadalupe Radio. Joseph, you're on with Father Trujillo. Hello. Um, my question was that um, I watched a movie recently, Anthropoid, in which uh, they told the story of the Czechoslovak soldiers in World War II who assassinated a high-ranking uh, uh, Nazi official, Reinhard Heydrich. By the end of the movie, the Nazis had trapped them in the cathedral, and rather than being captured, they committed suicide. So I'm wondering about the morality of that, because I, I imagine they were trying to prevent the Nazis from extracting information from them to do more evil. So just wondering about the morality of that. Yes, that's a, um, it's a very complicated situation. Obviously, uh, the, the church condemns uh, suicide, uh, the taking one's life uh, on your own. Uh, at the same token, um, one is allowed to, um, you know, like for instance, someone throws a grenade and uh, there's a bunch of soldiers there, and one of the guys throws himself on the grenade and takes the blast to save his his buddies. Uh, that's not considered suicide. Uh, that That's an act of, of heroism. And if someone has secrets, let's say you're in the military or you work for the CIA or something, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where you can't trust you know, what they may get out of you um, so in, in that context, it may not be, uh, at least from the subjective standpoint, uh, guilty of the, of the mortal sin of, of uh, suicide uh, because of that particular context. Um, but that's always something that needs to be looked at and, uh, you know, someone needs to think about that uh, whenever they're in, in those particular situations. I know, uh, at least in the old days, because uh, I had some family members who are still now in um, different agencies that we want to don't want to mention on the air, um, they may be prepared to uh, sacrifice themselves, uh, which is different than uh, taking your own life capriciously. Kathy's watching on Facebook, and she wants to know if our loved ones can see us when they die, and can they look out for us? Well, we believe that they do see and hear us because we call it the communion of saints, and to be in communion means you not only. Uh, are aware, but you're praying. We, you know, we believe the saints pray for us. We believe the souls in purgatory pray for us, and we in turn pray for them. So the souls in purgatory and the saints in heaven must have some type of infused knowledge where God uh, reveals to them what, who we are, where we are, what our needs are, because uh, otherwise they wouldn't know anything, because without our human bodies, our intellects, and our soul— have no means of, it'd be like a computer with no keyboard. You know, how are you going to get the information? 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. A couple of open lines at 833-288-3986. Next up is Bill in the great state of Colorado, listening on EWTN.com. Bill, you're on with Father John. Hello, Father. Thank you for taking my call. Hello? Yes, yes we're go, here. Go right ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I know we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but what are the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? 
Okay, well, it's it's both their names and their relationship. That's a good question. Uh, God the Father is Father, and that defines uh, him in his personhood. Uh, he is always Father, and for him to always be a Father means there must always be a Son, and the Son is always Son. Therefore, he must have a, a Father for that relationship, and the Holy Spirit is the fruit uh, of their mutual love for each other. So uh, their names not only describe their who they are, are, but it, it, it also defines uh, their, their essence. Thanks, Bill. We appreciate the phone call. Next up is Dan, a first-time caller in Springfield, Missouri, listening on Catholic Radio Network. Dan, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Father, thanks for taking my call. Um, in this day and age, I was wondering if a woman becomes a man in all aspects can they become a priest or deacon? Yes, um, uh, that's a question has already come up. There were some a couple seminarians or applica- applicants for the seminary. Not at my place, okay? I want to make absolutely sure this was not <laughs> at my seminary. Okay, this was somewhere else. Um, and it was not discovered that they were actually not uh, born male, but they would have become male uh by surgery or whatever t- techniques. Um, ontologically, you know, we believe that, you know, the moment of conception, you are a human person and your gender is part of your identity. So uh, even though physiologically you can change that, or at least people think they can change that, uh, you still are who you are. And, uh, you know, the church still makes it very clear that, uh, you know, you must be uh, a baptized uh, biological male uh, in order to be uh, ordained to the to the priesthood, and uh, likewise, if one's going to get married, it must be a biological male and a biological female. Uh, now, people can change how they appear; they can take hormones, they can have surgery, but it doesn't change ontologically uh, who they are, and uh, that's the bottom line. Yeah, the uh, the genetics of it never changes, right? No, I mean the chromosomes don't change. I mean you're either XX or XY. Um, you know, and that's why, you know, these people think they can have children while they can, you know, um, facilitate an artificial, uh, birth. But, uh, I mean, you're, you're not, if you're not producing eggs or you're not producing sperm, you, you're not going to actually be a parent. Alfonso watching us on YouTube wants to know, why does the church teach that there are two kinds of judgment? Can you explain this father? Well, the first judgment, which is the most important, is is particular judgment occurs immediately after death, and that determines where you're going to spend eternity. So, at particular judgment, if it's a little important, <laughs> if it, yes, absolutely. At particular judgment, if it turns out you're going to hell, that that's it. That seals it. You're never going to get out of there. There's no appeal. There's no reform, whatever. But likewise, if you're judged to go to heaven or purgatory, because purgatory is is uh, you know a guarantee that you will be going to heaven at some point. Um, General judgment is at the end of time when all the particular judges will be manifested and ratified so that everybody will know why so-and-so is in heaven. Or you might say, how did he get in here? Or why isn't she there? Or may may ask, why, where did you go? Um, general judgment is not a second judgment. It's a manifestation of the particular judgments, but to all of us so that we now see God's justice and mercy in its fullness. You know, this creates a lot of anxiety for, for some people, Father. Would it be fair to say that anyone who dies and is destined ultimately for heaven has nothing whatsoever to fear about the general judgment? No, and, and I mean, the general judgment is not should not scare anybody because it's like no one can, can get thrown out of heaven. <laughs> um, there's no way that if you're in, in purgatory, they say, oops, we made a mistake. Uh, you're going to end up in hell. And unfortunately, those in hell will, will stay in hell. So the general judgment uh, is just a proclamation of all the particular judgments. And that's the one we need to worry about. And if you're, you are you die in a state of uh, mortal sin, you're, you're in bad shape. That's why you should always be making good confessions regularly, being in a state of grace, because as Jesus says, you know not the day nor the hour. And that's in terms of your particular judgment. A lot of people worry about when's the world gonna end. Well, again, we don't know the day or hour for that, but my knowledge of the end of the world is irrelevant. Um, I'm judged by what did I do or not do, and did I conform my will to God's will, or did I oppose it? 
And on the other side of that coin, if your actions find yourself uh, in hell, the general judgment is going to be the least of your worries. Absolutely. What you have to worry about is the resurrection of the body, because if you're in hell with your soul, uh, it's going to be intensified when you get your body, because then the body's going to experience all the pain and suffering that at that moment only your soul did. But the converse is nice to think about. If you're in heaven, then your body will share in the joy and bliss just as your soul did. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Linda uh, in Camino Island, Washington, Grace in South Bend, Indiana, Ernie in the great state of Colorado, and we want to talk to you as well. That number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's EWTN's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. We live in a world of extreme polarization, often consumed by anger and anxiety, a climate that is dividing our country and our world, a division so wide, there is even confusion within our church. And today, most secular news sources only serve to deepen this divide. But at Catholic News Agency, our mission is to be a witness to the truth of our Catholic faith, providing trustworthy, relevant, and timely news affecting the global church, as well as in-depth coverage of the Pope, the Vatican, the church in the U.S., and the ongoing battle for the culture of life. Every day, CNA's reporters and editors maintain a continuous, faithful watch on the people and the events that impact lives and the souls of Catholics, delivering more news from a Catholic perspective than anyone else. Catholic News Agency, a service of EWTN News. Trusted, timely, Catholic. Engage at catholicnewsagency.com. This is Jack Williams. If you missed any part of today's show, catch the Encore tonight at 10 Eastern. And check out the podcast anytime at EWTNradio.net and click podcast. Faith is a precious gift from God. As the largest religious media network in the world, EWTN has an important role in educating others about our Catholic faith and spreading the good news of salvation. We invite you to explore our numerous pages of historical faith documents, prayers, teachings, and other current issues in Catholicism today. Visit EWTN.com and click Catholicism. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Matt Swaim here. Join me weekday mornings for the Sunrise Morning Show. We cover all the topics you care about most from a Catholic perspective, plus news, weather, sports, and a whole lot more. Now back to Open Line with Father John Tregilia. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Linda in Camino Island, Washington, uh, listening on the Amazon Echo. Linda, thank you so much for your patience. You're on with Father Tregilio. Hi, Hi, Father. Uh, go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, discerning God's will. Um, I've been struggling with that issue for decades, and uh, I'm still not sure whether I know uh, what God's will for me is. Um, I have to make a decision in the next uh, few weeks about my job. Uh, My job, the principal uh, transferred me to another position in the same school, and um, I would rather not. uh, And I was thinking of uh, involving the union uh, in order to fight this uh, decision. Uh, But on the other hand, I'm thinking, oh, maybe this is God's will for me. Um, Maybe this is what I I need to do. but I don't know. It could be Satan's will. It could be someone, uh, someone else's will. Uh, uh, how do I know? How do I discern yes. what God? Yes. Well, that's a very, very, very good question, and uh, we have to realize that God doesn't treat us like pawns on a chessboard. So uh, we just don't fall into the the rail tracks there, and and we have no participation. Uh, God respects our free will, and um, he certainly wants us to employ prudence. So if you've prayed about this, 
you've studied it, you've talked it over with people you respect, their opinions, you've talked to hopefully your spiritual director or your confessor for some spiritual advice, and this is a prudent and reasonable thing that you, you're planning to do, then you know, I would say go uh, try for it. You know, the, this, talk to the, the, the labor union or um, talk to someone to see if you can uh, go the route you want. And then if it turns out it doesn't work that way, then you say, well, then that must be God's will. But uh, you don't have to feel like you're a passenger on the back of the plane and, and God's flying. And he's going to take you wherever uh, he decides you're going to go. Uh, he, he works with us. Uh, we, he wants our will to conform to his will, but we're not just, you know, um, machinery that, that works uh, uh, by itself. Uh, he will respect our, and he can, you know, even when we make mistakes, you know, sometimes um, I've, I've told seminarians, as if, you know, if you've been ordained five, 10 years or a guy's been married five, 10 years, they say, oh, maybe, maybe I'm, I, I made the wrong choice, but you made the choice and God will give you the grace through the sacrament uh, to continue that, even if all things being equal, maybe you should have chosen differently, but you've made commitments and God can work through that. So likewise, I would say go for what you believe is the prudent and reasonable thing for, uh, that you, uh, for your uh, um, future. And uh, if it doesn't work out, then, then you can say, well, all right, I, at least I tried. And one great thing you've done, Linda, is by calling the program, you'll have a whole lot of people that are listening today that will be praying for you. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Grace is in South Bend, Indiana, a first-time caller listening on Redeemer Radio. Grace, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Hello. So the other day, my brother and I were debating on heaven. And we both, I mean, understanding, I have not seen here, I have not heard what God has ready. But I reasoned that we will still have our body and our soul. Like, Jesus was assumed into heaven, body and soul. Mary assumed that JP2 talks about theology of the body and how united our body and soul are. Mm -hmm. And he reasons, on the other hand, like I would confront him and say, he says it's a higher level of consciousness. We can't even comprehend it. We'll be united in one body. We'll all be, like, melded together almost. And I say, well, no, like Adam and Eve, they were individuals, and they had that full unity. Yeah. So is there an answer to us on if we will be an individual in heaven? I would think of the same. Yes, they're individuals, but... Yes. Yeah, you're, you're on the right track. Unfortunately, your brother is a little off target there. <laughs> Um, cause our, our Christianity in general and Catholicism in particular, uh, is very incarnational and Jesus, as you mentioned, you know, he ascended into heaven, he took his body, uh, and his soul up to heaven. And then Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. And as we mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, at the end of the world with the second coming of Christ, and you've got the resurrection of the dead, uh, the general judgment, uh, those who have reunited with their bodies their bodies will either be taken up to heaven or be reunited and taken back to hell. You will be a, a, an individual. It's just that the, the the communion that exists is perfect, but it's not some kind of uh, pantheism where we all become God or we're just you know some uh, you know Star Trek idea of of a, of a gestalt consciousness. Uh, that's not what Christianity teaches. So that uh, Adam and Eve, as you mentioned, are are. Uh, distinct persons. Uh, Virgin Mary is, St. Joseph, uh, Jesus in his sacred humanity is. So uh, what we can't imagine, though, is what a glorified body is like. We just see what Jesus did after his resurrection. He ate fish, not because he had to. There's The beauty of a resurrected body is there's no hunger. Uh, you don't need sleep. Uh, but as St. Thomas Aquinas speculated, that doesn't mean that you won't be able to eat because uh, you can enjoy the food with a resurrected body. You just have to worry. No more carbs, no more uh, you know gluten stuff to worry about, uh, no more triglycerides and that. Uh, it's for the social uh, dimension and, and the personal enjoyment. Uh, so yes, uh, we will be in heaven if we get to heaven. Uh, and someday we'll be reunited with our bodies, but we will be uh, distinct, but not separate. How's that, Grace? Beautiful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for the phone call. 
833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Elisa in San Antonio, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Elisa, you're on with Father John. Hi, Father John. It's so nice to, to meet you, kind of. Um, I'm just driving home today and just turned the radio on to your station, and you were having a conversation, probably on the tail end, of mortal sin in regards to suicide. And you spoke a bit on suicide taking one's life as opposed to uh, a suicide based on honor or bravery to save the life of another. My question to you is, as somebody that is exploring, I'm continuously exploring my faith and learning, I'm trying to understand how a, a loving and merciful God would punish an individual when they do something out of the lowest point in their life, which would be taking their own lives because they yes. can't deal with it anymore. So can you please explain that to me? Sure, absolutely. And and I'm glad you asked that. Um, because when we say suicide is a mortal sin, we're saying that it's grave matter. But again, as from the Council of Trent and it's in our current catechism, uh, in addition to grave matter, for it to be a mortal sin, one must have full consent of the will and sufficient knowledge. And that full consent of the will is the is the key here because I've had a priest friend of mine that uh, he took his own life and um, you know, but he was suffering severe clinical depression. And that's why the church no longer uh, denies Catholic burial like we did in the past um, when someone is a suicide victim. And we even use that terminology, suicide victim. But there is the possibility, let's say you've got a gangster or um, someone who's a terrorist, and uh, they take their life and they know what they're doing. And the only reason why they're doing it is because, you know, they don't want to go to jail. Um, that's not necessarily um, – you know, something that you could say, oh, well, I understand that. Uh, but on the same token, someone who's gone through depression, anxiety, huge stress, all number of things, we're not aware of their mental state. We're not aware of how much knowledge they had. We're not aware of how much their will was involved uh, because mental illness, you know, does affect. It doesn't destroy, but it affects our, our free will, as does um, substance abuse. Um, you know, a gross fear and, and, and things like that. So we give people the benefit of the doubt, uh, except, you know, in those rare cases where it's kind of obvious this person took their life because, you know, it's not that they were a coward during wartime. You know, that, that's not something we would, uh, you know, look at. But let's say it was a it was a terrorist, you know, and they are slamming their plane in, into the World Trade Center. Well, they're taking their life, but also lives of, of 3,000 other people. Uh, that's not something where you, I think you could say, oh, well, you give them the benefit of, of, of the doubt. So, but we want people to realize that sometimes that's all they need to know is that I don't want to commit suicide because I could potentially be uh, guilty of a mortal sin. So that might uh, preserve somebody who's a, a weak but not completely weak but the same token those who have taken their lives we we treat with uh, mercy and charity and we give them the benefit of the doubt so we we no longer um, you know put them in that category but the same token uh, like I was describing I would not define it as suicide if, if, like the guy who throws himself on the grenade he did not commit suicide he sacrificed himself for his his buddies uh, suicide is when you take your life uh, directly and uh, whether it's euthanasia or uh, any any other means is that helpful to you elisa so it so it is it definitely depending on why you take your life i just worry that um if someone is suffering so greatly and this is to include euthanasia in my mind um because of great great physical and, and mental pain they still are at risk of basically going to hell. That's what you're telling me. No, they would be if they're in complete control of their faculties and they're, they are free enough to, to, you know, say no to the temptation to commit. Now, I know there, there's a lot of people who have terminal illness. I had a brother who had muscular dystrophy. He suffered terribly. Uh, I had a dad who had leukemia. I know people who are going through horrible, horrible physical suffering. Um, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, if, if God forbid they, they, have someone assist them uh, that they would be guilty of, of suicide. But the potential 
is there. And that's why, and the church tells us we cannot take, help anyone take their life. Uh, you know, no matter what the reason is, we can make them comfortable, give them as much painkiller as possible without it being the cause of their death. But uh, we don't want to ever, uh, because, you know, the ends never justifies the means. So there's never, ever a reason that that uh, suicide is justifiable. But the, the uh, context in which the person does take their life, that's the thing we need to analyze. Uh, and, and again, only God knows subjectively how guilty the person was. But uh, at an objective level, we want to say to people that, no, this is not good behavior. There's always another way. Next up is Mary in the great state of Illinois, listening on Covenant Radio. Mary, you're on with Father Trujillo. Good afternoon, Father. How are you? Fine. Great. I have a question about plenary indulgence. Um, I watch a lot of videos of Dr. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Father Chris Alar, and uh, he says that you know he gives the list of what you need to do to get a plenary indulgence, but he says. You can't have any attachment to sin. So my question is, is if I go to church, if I go to Mass, and I receive Holy Communion, and my venial sins are forgiven, is he speaking of the atonement, the stain on your soul, or is he talking about, you know, just, you know, sins on your soul that, that you haven't yes. confessed? Yes. Uh, well, what the Church requires for you to have, receive the plenary indulgence, which is the full remission of all temporal punishment due to sin. And that's that's the complete, total, full remission. Uh, you know, like the governor giving you the complete pardon, okay? It, it's 100%. Uh, you must be detached even from venial sin. And then, of course, you know, do the specified work or, or action, uh, like make a, a say a pros, pray a rosary for the Blessed Sacrament or Divine Mercy Sunday and so forth. And then receive communion, go to confession 21 days before or, or after, and then say prayers for the intention of Holy Father. That detachment from venial sin means it, that's what's required for it to be a plenary indulgence. If there's any attachment, and that means like a fond memory of one of our previous venial sins, or yeah, I forgave somebody, but mm, it's not really 100%. There's still a little uh, left in me. Then it defaults from plenary to partial. So there's still a benefit. It's just not it's not the full remission of temporal punishment due to sin. And so uh, some is better than none, but we want to aim for the full if we can. And that's why, you know, uh, try to go try to uh, obtain as many plenary indulgences as possible, because we just don't know uh, if they actually become a plenary indulgence or if they default to a, a partial. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Be sure to join us for Catholic Answers Live tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, two full hours of open line uh, of open forum Q&A with apologist Joe Heschmeyer. Uh, 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Allison. She is in Great Falls, Montana, listening on St. Michael Radio. Allison, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. What's your question? Um, I was wondering, what do you do in heaven? That's a good question. <laughs> um, heaven is not like some people depict in, in art or on television or movies that you're just floating around in a white gown with wings and you're plucking on a harp. Uh, that's not heaven. Heaven is a wonderful family reunion where you reunited with all the people who died who are in heaven. So all your grandparents and grand, uh, great grandparents, your moms, your dads, your sons, your daughters, brothers, sisters, your next door neighbor, uh, you're there with them. And most importantly, you're, you're in the presence of God. And what we do is we worship God. I mean, that is the, the highest form uh of activity that a, a created being can do. So the angels are worshiping God, we're worshiping God. And it's not like being in a, in a mass that never ends. I, was, I, I mentioned that once to uh, third graders and they said, oh, I don't want to go to mass forever and ever. I said, well, it's not a mass where you're sitting in the pew and you're listening to some boring sermon or listening to a horrible choir. Uh, we worshiping God, we're, we're happy to be there. We want to praise the Lord, but we're in each other's um, company. It's, that's called communio. We're united with everyone in heaven and also with any souls in purgatory and with any of the living on earth. The only separation is those who are in hell. They are completely, totally isolated from each other, 
and from all of us and from God. And they chose to, to, to uh, experience that. So in heaven, we're going to be busy. We're just not going to get tired and we're going to be doing what we want to do. And, and it's the greatest joy. So you're going to be doing exactly what you love to do. Uh, it's just that eye is not seen, ear is not heard. What exactly the joy uh, is going to be, we can only scratch the surface. You know, Father John, you touched on something earlier in the program when you talked about uh, uh, what things will be like with our glorified bodies. Allison, what is your absolute favorite food? Pizza. Imagine if you could eat pizza (laughs) and keep eating pizza and never get full and never get get, uh, a stomach ache or or never get full or, or have any... Any of the bad feelings that you get if you eat too much pizza, but you could just eat pizza as long as you wanted to, and nothing ever changed except you eating the pizza, heaven's going to be way better than that. Huh, Father? Oh, absolutely. And imagine being with all your friends, everybody you love forever and ever. You're never going to be alone. Uh, You're always going to be with people that love you, that want you to be there. Uh, It's just one constant joy after another. It's like Christmas morning forever and ever. <laughs> Does that sound good, Allison? Yeah. All right. Thanks for the phone call today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Uh, we head next to the great state of Maryland. George is listening on the EWTN app. George, thanks for holding. You're on with Father John. Hey, Father John. Good afternoon. Thank you for Hello. Uh, picking up my call. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Can you hear me? Very yes, good. we can. So uh, my my question is a question and a comment and uh, some sort of uh, looking for help. So I hear a lot of prayers, a lot of talk, a lot of support for the unborn uh, from our Catholic Church, which is very wonderful. My question to you is, could the Church do a little bit more than what I see in the media, especially, for those young and uh, African-American men who are really forgotten for the most part? Or am I missing? Because a lot of young people are asking that question. Why doesn't the Catholic Church talk about these issues as it does for the unborn? Okay. Um, I only heard part of the uh, the question. Um, was was Are you asking... Other besides the pro-life issue, also um, talking about the the dignity and sanctity of all human life. Um, yeah, and he you know, was talking specifically about the the young African American men okay. that are in prison. If yes. we if we launch the offensive that we do for the unborn towards those people, what kind of a difference that might make? Yeah, and I mean every single pope, uh, the catechism. Um, the, the, the consistent teaching, the social teachings of our church make it clear that, yeah, we, we support and defend human life in all its stages from conception to natural death. We make that very clear, not just in our prayers of the faithful at mass, but in the, what the church has written and in, in the, you know, Catholic charities, which is in every diocese, uh, uh provides help to everybody. They make sure that, you know, uh, people in prison, uh, get a visit from a chaplain, uh, that the church works arduously against um, uh, racism and injustices. And, uh, you know, certainly every pope that's been in the re- in recent times, you know, has worked to uh, uh, eradicate like uh, the death penalty, um, unjust wars. So although it may not seem in the, in the public eye, or especially in the media that likes to zero in on polemic uh, positions, the, the, in the media, we, it looks as if Catholics only worry about the unborn. And that's not true. I mean, I know of many institutions that within the church and that the church herself does and say, and says, and priests, uh, friends of mine who are chaplains, they work across the board uh, in defending the unborn, but also those who are terminally ill, as well as uh, making sure that people are treated justly and fairly, that, you know, that uh, racism, anti-Semitism, any type of, of injustice uh, is denounced. And remember, it was a lot. Of, there were a lot of um, Catholic priests, and you know, um, who marched in, in in Selma, and and uh, there were a lot of Christians. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, he was a Baptist preacher. Um, the people who worked against slavery and against segregation 
a lot of them were people of faith, of, of the Christian faith. They weren't the only ones, but they were the predominant ones. And that's the way I think it, it will always be, that it's people of faith who uh, zero in on, on, on the things that need to be looked at and, and denounced and then replaced by more fair, just uh, things. You know, it's interesting, Father, because I can think, when you think about permanent deacons, and I can think of one permanent deacon that I know of whose wife uh, operates a, a crisis pregnancy center, who has what you would consider, I guess, a a defined pro-life ministry, and he's the only one that I can think of, but I know dozens of permanent deacons who have active prison ministries. Oh, yeah, so do I, and um, and they they do a, they have a, a great insight uh, or so to speak, because they come from the secular world. They have a wife and family. Um, whereas, you know, as a as a priest, yeah, the people are appreciative that we can say mass and hear confession and anoint. But sometimes the deacon can get to them right away and knows that, yeah, I I, I can hear what you're saying. I, I have family problems too. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have to work in the world. So uh, the deacons are a wonderful uh you know, medium in, 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 in that sense. And um, even the, the lay people, I know lots of wonderful lay Catholics who work uh, in prison ministry and in the, uh, the, in the penal system and also working towards rehabilitation. So it's not just, you know, incarceration, but it's rehabilitating and also um, making sure that the court system is more uh, fair and, and uh, across the board. Uh, quickly, we'll head to Linda in the great state of Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Linda, just a couple minutes left with Father John. What's your question today? My question is, hi, Father John. Hi, Jack. Is uh, the Catholic Church's position on cremation? Yeah, it's permitted, but only if the person is not denying the resurrection. And I know I don't think there's people who deny it, but you have to question where they're... Um, perspective is when you cremate someone, they need to be buried intact. That means either in an urn or a box in the ground or at sea, but no scattering of the ashes. Um, cremation is permitted. Uh, people think they're going to be saving a lot of money, but now I've heard where, you know, they put the cremains in a vase and then they put it in a glass container that looks like a casket. So the people end up paying the same amount of money <laughs> as they would uh, if they had a regular uh, funeral. But no matter if the person is cremated or not, they need a mass. They need a mass for their immortal soul. I'm so sad when I hear of Catholics dying. The cremation part isn't as sad as the fact that they'll say, Father, we don't want a mass. Uh, just come to the cemetery, say a few prayers as, we, as they throw them in the hole. That's horrible. Uh, there's nothing greater you can do for a deceased person than have a mass offered for them. So a funeral mass, whether it's with the body or with the ashes uh, is certainly uh, uh, permitted and encouraged. And I can tell you from a personal standpoint, I buried two brothers, my mom and dad. Um, having a traditional funeral was good for me. And it was uh, to see uh, our parents, even though they were they were deceased for that last time, to give them that respect. Uh, you know, I, I think if, if it's if it's possible and feasible, you know, I, I think that's the, the best way to go. But the church allows cremation as long as you're not denying the fact that that person is going to come uh, back to life so keeping grandma on the mantle no um, people don't leave them at the funeral home no don't scatter them in the air or in the woods or set them up in a spaceship bury them in the ground in sacred ground or bury them at sea uh, in a container it's EWTN's Open Line Friday with Father John Tregilio. Oh, well, how am I doing? Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Until we get together tomorrow with Father Wade, God bless. Here is today's quote from Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar. You need a teaching authority that says this is right and this is wrong. You've got to go by some thermometer, some rule of thumb in